American workers lost their jobs, one out of every four workers was jobless. Only a handful of wealthy investors profited from the collapse of the stock market, like President John F. Kennedy's father, Joseph P. Kennedy, or brilliant investor and presidential advisor, Bernard Baruch, who became legendary as the man who sold out before the crash. Performer and humorist Will Rogers probably put it best. Ten men in our country could buy the whole world, and ten million can't buy enough to eat. So the millions of less fortunate Americans faced a grim and uncertain future. Soup kitchens and bread lines became as commonplace as the flappers and speakeasies of the Roaring Twenties. And Herbert Hoover's campaign promise of a chicken in every pot couldn't have been farther from the truth. America's towns and cities struggled in vain to help the thousands in need. The jobless became the homeless. Shanty towns, makeshift communities of shacks constructed from wooden crates, tar paper, and cardboard sprang up. Disillusioned citizens called them Hoovervilles after the president. And the newspapers they slipped under, Hoover blankets. Others left the city to ride the rails, looking for work. Too poor to purchase train tickets, they hitched rides on freight cars, hoping they wouldn't be caught, hoping they'd find a job. Approximately two million men became hobos, wandering the countryside looking for work. Between 1929 and 1932, Roughly 400,000 farms were foreclosed when farmers couldn't pay their mortgages and banks repossessed the property. Thousands of farm families became migrant workers, following crop harvests to eke out a living. Then, to make matters even worse, drought, coupled with the overproduction of crops in the Great Plains, turned the area from Texas to Oklahoma into a dust bowl. In 1934, Strong winds blew tons of dust from the plains all the way to the East Coast. Dust even coated New York City and settled on ships 500 miles out to sea in the Atlantic Ocean. Unemployment and poverty hurt everyone, especially children. Many left school to work and help their families survive, and many more went hungry and malnourished. Diet-related illnesses like rickets and scoliosis became all too common. Once again, President Hoover tried to reassure the nation by saying, recovery is just around the corner. But it was not to be. And more Americans grew disenchanted with his policies and administration. Secretary of the Treasury Andrew Mellon echoed the beliefs of most of Hoover's advisors that the economy would recover on its own. Hoover thought the government must take some action, but feared making government too strong. And so he chose a conservative approach, calling together business, banking, and labor leaders, and urging them to work together and avoid laying off workers or calling strikes. Then he authorized the expenditure of federal funds for large public works projects, like Boulder Dam, later renamed Hoover Dam, to create jobs and wages for thousands of workers. Hoover felt giving direct help to needy Americans would undermine their self-respect and look to private charities to help the hungry. Instead, he approved more than two billion dollars in emergency financing to businesses, hoping their renewed success would trickle down to the people who needed assistance. It didn't. Rather, unemployment rose even higher and Americans were caught in a web of despair. Americans, already tired of Hoover's pessimistic and cautious approach, then became outraged by his treatment of a group of World War I veterans in 1932. After the war, Congress issued veterans bonus certificates for their military service worth nearly $1,000 to be redeemed in 1945. Dismayed by the economic outlook of the time, the veterans demanded the immediate payment of their bonuses in full. In an attempt to satisfy their demand, Texas Congressman Wright Patman proposed a bill in which the government would immediately give veterans $500 in cash instead. 
to show their support of Patman's plan, between 10 and 20,000 veterans and their families peacefully marched to Washington, D.C. This so-called bonus army established a shanty town inside of the Capitol building. Hoover provided food and supplies for them, but when Congress vetoed the bill on June 17th, he asked the bonus army to leave. Most left, but approximately 2,000 stayed behind, hoping to meet with Hoover. During a riot, Hoover ordered General Douglas MacArthur and the 12th Infantry Force to remove the veterans. Shocked Americans saw troops use bayonets and tear gas to force the vets to leave. In the melee, more than 1,000 people were gassed, an 8-year-old boy blinded, and an 11-month-old baby was killed. The shantytown burned to the ground. Public support for Hoover foundered, and with a chance to change direction, Americans overwhelmingly embraced a new president in Franklin Delano Roosevelt, popularly known as FDR.